Well, this was my first stop in China. I spent three years here studying for my master's degree and I've got a lot of good memories here. I was a Chinese language and literature major. I've been studying languages, I guess you could say seriously, since I was about 15. And Chinese has always been my strongest language. And actually, after graduation, I originally wanted to be a language teacher, but obviously I went a different path and I guess that's just a kind of event fun. I had no idea that we were going to see so many changes over a short couple of years. And it feels like China's always trying to do its best to stay ahead of the game in terms of making life here easier, especially when it comes to technology. Then the first one that comes to my mind is transportation. Just look at Beijing's subway network and how that's developed over the last decade. I knew you were going to say that. I've actually prepared a map for you. Oh, wow. Yeah, so when I arrived in Beijing, there was only a dozen subway lines. But look at this, we've now got 27 subway lines in Beijing. And what's funny is I don't even like getting the subway anymore because we've got so many cool bike sharing apps in Beijing. Especially on a day like today, there's nothing better than just getting on a bike and cycling home on a nice warm sunny day. What's more, it's the fact that it's all linked together by China's mobile payment services. I mean, look at WeChat. I can use it to get on a bike, get in the subway, or just go in a store and buy something. It's, it's just super convenient. Yeah, I mean, after the outbreak of the pandemic, the government partnered with mobile payment apps to launch a service bookmarking our vaccination status and the last time we had a nucleic test. And while this might not seem like a big deal, it meant the widespread adaptation of a system that first of all keeps us safe, but secondly, it reduces disturbances to domestic travel, which has been super convenient. I mean, for me, it's got to be high-speed rail. Back when I joined Xinhua News Agency in 2018, the first story I worked on depicted the commute of a businesswoman from Beijing to the neighbouring city of Tianjin. And working on this story, I couldn't help but think of my hometown in the UK, Brighton & Hove. It's nicknamed London by the Sea, and similar to Beijing and Tianjin, it sees a high volume of daily rail commuters. However, the similarities end there, and this story really taught me the importance of building strong infrastructure. I mean, take Beijing and Tianjin, for example. To go from one city to the other by train, you cover a distance of 120 kilometres, and you can make the trip in just 30 minutes. From Brighton to London, on the other hand, you're looking at a distance of just 80 kilometres, but that journey takes one hour by train. And I'm not simply advocating that the UK needs to invest more in high-speed rail, which they are currently doing. The larger point here is the importance of how China has been proactive towards modernity. And over the past decade, high-speed rails have developed so rapidly in China. I mean, the country has the world's longest high-speed rail network. The network links all of its major megacity clusters and most people I talk to, regardless if they work in media, business or their students, they actually seem to prefer getting on the train to flying. I assume you are interested in Chinese culture. Yeah, growing up I was fascinated by Chinese mythical stories and I guess ultimately it's part of what inspired me to learn Mandarin in the first place. I mean, take Sun Wukong for example. His size-changing staff has become a pretty iconic pop culture reference. And it's not just his superpowers but also his character where you get the appeal of the Monkey King. I mean, he's smart, he's persistent, and he's a bit cynical, which is great for me because that's kind of reminiscent of the characters you get in British television shows. As China's opened up in this respect, the charm of Chinese culture has been in full display over the past decade. I mean, take Nerja for example. Released in 2019, it's China's highest ever grossing animated movie. And it also released in a bunch of foreign countries, including the US. I mean, Nerja, although she's seemingly rebellious, still exhibits the values of Chinese culture like dedication and responsibility. And the film is beautifully animated, which for me personally is a huge selling point. And it shows all the traits of Chinese culture. And what's really interesting as well, an animated movie may seem trivial, I think it's actually more important than you might imagine. Because it's an example of taking China's rich lore and history and packaging it into a modern medium that everyone can enjoy. And with its financial success, I wouldn't be surprised if in the future we see more movie, animation, maybe even game companies using different modern mediums to introduce China's vast mythology and culture to the world. It's not just on the screen. We can see the modernization of classical Chinese culture here in real life too. I mean, a few weeks ago, I took a walk through the Forbidden City and I saw a load of young people taking photos wearing modern variations of a traditional Chinese hand through. And in the domestic cosmetic industry as well, we've also seen a lot of companies using traditional Chinese designs. I've been fortunate enough to experience China with my own two eyes for more than a decade now. And now people around the world will be able to experience China in a more vivid fashion than ever before. 
So, did you find it hard to learn Chinese? I mean, at the beginning, yes, but if you find something interesting, you naturally devote more time to it, and that in itself makes it a lot easier. And the thing is, the language has allowed me to know the real China, which never ceases to amaze me. So, Sam, I really want to just ask you one question in Chinese. Oh, sure. Uh, you think in the next 